Welcome back, awesome people, to Cocktails and Consoles. It's Melissa, and we are celebrating the release of the latest Resident Evil title, Resident Evil 7, where we are going to be making a cocktail inspired by that game and also talk a little bit about what does it mean to be a Resident Evil title and how does this game stack up? So if you guys are familiar with the show that Aaron Hansen does called Sequelitis, where he talks about what it means to be a Zelda title, I thought I'd go into a little bit of the same and talk about what does it mean to be a Resident Evil title? When you look at a game, how do you know if it's Resident Evil? When Resident Evil took the stage in the 90s, it really set itself apart from any other horror game of its time through its ability to create thematic horror. And every Resident Evil game from 0 all the way till 6 has had its success in doing this to varying degrees by leveraging three key elements in every game. Music was used seldomly at the beginning of every Resident Evil game, finally rising to a crescendo at the end to let the ambient noises of the game take stage and unnerve players. By limiting the player's view of a room, it forces the players to have to slow down and carefully approach every corner, not knowing what might be lying around them. The open door transition was originally created to buy the devs time to be able to render the next room, but worked an unintended wonder in building tension as to what lie next for the players. Let's take a look at how Resident Evil 7 builds upon these foundations and then takes it to a whole new level of thematic horror. Ah, fuck! Fuck! This is the first Resident Evil title to leverage first-person view. Especially when used with the VR headset, it lets the player feel like it's them walking through the house rather than the character. Even in first-person view, visibility is limited even more, which adds to the tension. When entering a new room, players will have to explore the room head-on, which means if there's anything in there that's going to scare them, it's going to be right in their face. Where Resident Evil 7 stays true to its roots is in its pleasant limit of constant jump scares, which has dominated the horror scene of today since Five Nights at Freddy's. Instead, it relies on building that constant tension so when a jump scare comes, it's all the more powerful. At the core of every Resident Evil game, it is all about survival, not shoot 'em up. Players are accustomed to being dropped into dire situations and tested on their ability to survive. Having forced, limited inventory space meant that the player had to be smart about what they carried around with them at all times. No longer could characters become pack mules that they used to be, you had to plan out what you had on hand at any given time to be able to open doors or further the progress. Sadly, Resident Evil got away from this in the later titles, especially Resident Evil 6, where it seemed like there was no limitations to what a character could carry. Seeing limited inventory space come back in Resident Evil 7 was very welcome indeed, for it forced players to have to play smart again. Even in a game like Resident Evil, with such a plethora of gun types, everyone will tell you that the expectation was always to conserve your ammunition, and the best way to do this was to avoid rather than attack zombies. By Resident Evil 5, this tactic had fallen away to a ridiculous level, where suddenly the game became less of survival horror and more Call of Duty. I mean, Seriously, tanks in a Resident Evil game. Friggin' tanks in a Resident Evil game. What the fuck is this? Sadly, this is one area where I felt Resident Evil 7 missed the mark. While you're not inundated with zombies to kill, the mobs that you do encounter 
You encounter them in very limited areas, often in very narrow hallways or a boss encounter, meaning you have no opportunity in which to navigate around them, you have to shoot them. This was the most frustrating part about Resident Evil 7. They introduced a new mechanic which I thought was genius for the series, which is the hiding mechanic. If you've played Outlast, if you've played PT, you're very familiar with this mechanic. And in an IP like Resident Evil, it is a perfect home, especially when the goal is to avoid rather than attack. Unfortunately, this mechanic was not able to be used on trash mobs where it would have made sense and instead was used in places that sub for either a cutscene or in place of a quick time event. Hopefully we'll see more use of this mechanic in future Resident Evil titles. Perhaps the biggest challenge for rebuilding a well-established series like Resident Evil is how do you know if you're playing a Resident Evil game when the iconic characters are no longer there? A question that undoubtedly faced all of us Resident Evil fans, especially after Resident Evil 6, was what's left that can be done with these characters? You've taken Leon Kennedy from a first day officer on the job to being friends with the president in the Secret Service. Chris Redfield, once a lowly member of STARS, is now hailed as a war hero when he's not being a drunken, abusive asshole. The problem that this causes is, as big as the characters get, the situations that they have to be in have to be equally big in order to compensate. This leaves the game with having to go to ridiculous lengths such as outrunning an explosion from a plane, or flying a helicopter into a building. Where once you have survival horror, you now have Die Hard. How long you say this place has been abandoned? As tough as it is to let go of such beloved characters, Resident Evil 7 went smart, and they went small. The characters in this game aren't larger than life, they're the people next door, which really adds to potential fear because it shows that evil can be anywhere. And it gives the platform a place to be able to grow these characters from. The characters in Resident Evil not only provided a universe for the story, it also drove the player experience. Who you picked to play, the items that you did or did not pick up, and the people that you chose to save or not to save, not only dictated the story that you got to open up, but also more specifically the end game that you got to experience. While Resident Evil 7 doesn't give you the ability to choose a different character at the beginning of the game, you are still given the opportunity towards the later part of the game to make a critical decision. This decision will determine how your end game is played out. This not only helps to keep the suspense high, but also helps with replayability. This of course begs the question, should Capcom bring back the original Resident Evil characters? Is there anything left that can be done with them? Are there any open questions that people still want answered? Is Chris still taking out his frustrations on unsuspecting boulders? Does Barry ever get his Jill sandwich? Will Leon and Ada ever just admit that they're in love with each other? Capcom, I need this to happen. So now, for those of you guys who know me, you know I love me some Resident Evil. So no ordinary cocktail is gonna be able to do to celebrate the relaunch of Resident Evil. So in the spirit of thematic horror, in the spirit of taking a page from the area in which they were trying to replicate in the game, we are making a cocktail that is well known in Louisiana, which is where they staged it, called the Hurricane. But we are making a couple of pretty significant changes to it. Now, for those of you guys who have never had a hurricane, it is a rum-based drink, and normally it's 
pretty sweet. We're getting around that issue this time by, instead of using passion fruit juice, we are using blood orange juice. This is much more stringent, a little bit more tannic than your standard orange juice, so it's not as sweet. So to help us kick this off, we are starting with two ounces of any kind of basic white rum. I'm using this Don Q that I used for uh, Ditsical Games's cocktail. I really like it. It's very much a workhorse white rum. It's not that strong in flavor, so it allows for other flavors to kind of take the stage. To that, we're gonna add one ounce of freshly squeezed lime juice. Next, two ounces of blueberry syrup. And then finally, three ounces of freshly squeezed blood orange juice. Now, in your standard hurricane, you would normally add two ounces of dark rum into the mix before you shake, but we're actually gonna float that on top, kind of like how they do a Mai Tai. Lit it up and shake. Oh God, that color already. Mm. So now this part is completely optional. I did it for a little bit of decoration, but you can totally skip this. We are going to add a couple pieces of black licorice into the glass to kind of mimic that DNA helix structure. Just make it a little bit more creepy. Now, depending on the freshness of your licorice, you may have to go the tactic that I had to, which is I wrapped the licorice around a thinner glass than the one that we're using, wrap that in some tin foil and put it in the freezer. So that way it'll hold the shape. So all we need to do is just loosen the bonds. Be very careful because black licorice is often slightly more delicate than red licorice. I don't know why. And there you go. I'm gonna slide that into the glass and pour. And finally, it would definitely not be a hurricane without that dark rum. So any kind of dark rum you can use. I, using up the last of my Kraken black spice rum because, I mean, God, just look at that bottle. Now, because of the amount of sugar that we've added, it should automatically float to the top. Again, the whole density thing. If you're new to bartending or if you're new to my channel and if you want to check it out, I've talked about it before on other videos. If you guys would like a video just kind of talking about density and how to float a cocktail or a shot, let me know. I'd be happy to do one for you. And now we have that darkness bleeding into the red with the helix. That is thematic horror for cocktails. And there you go. Now, you may wanna give this a stir before you sip it because again, all that dark rum is sitting up at the top. Now, in the spirit of Resident Evil 7, I'm calling this one Evie's Gift. If you played the game, this will make a lot of sense. And there you have it. One dark and delicious version of a hurricane. Now, warning. This is a very strong drink. If you haven't counted so far, we have four ounces of alcohol in here. If that's not to your liking, you can always bring it back and use an ounce of half of rum, an ounce of half, half of dark rum. Cheers. Ooh. That's got some kick. Oh. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. We'd love to hear your thoughts down below on how you guys are liking the new Resident Evil 7, what you guys are looking for in the new Resident Evil 8, and get your thoughts on what does it mean to be a Resident Evil title, and does this game really separate itself from other popular games like Outlast and PT? Till next time, awesome people. Cheers! Cheers.